In our last lecture, I spoke about the concepts of society and culture and how those ideas structured our understanding of human behavior. One of the main traits of culture is that it is constantly changing, and this is an essential thing to understand. No human culture is static and unchanging, and any complete understanding of culture requires us to understand how and why it changes. The explanation of change has not always been central to anthropology, however. For a long time, it was traditional for anthropologists to discuss cultures as they were at the first time they were documented in writing, whether or not those cultures still practiced those ways of life. Ethnographies were written in the present tense, even though the anthropologist might well have been describing practices that only existed in the memories of his or her informants. For example, an early 20th century anthropologist might describe native Hawaiians as worshiping the fire goddess Pele, when in fact the people telling him about native religion were Christian converts and hadn't worshiped Pele for generations. This approach came to be called the ethnographic present and it gave the impression that these non-Western cultures were static and fixed, while Western cultures were dynamic and changing. It's clearly an inaccurate depiction of any culture, but it reflects a basic truth. You can't study change at all until you've described at least two states, the before and the after. If anthropologists really want to understand and explain human culture, we must not only look at how it operates at a single point in time, called a synchronic study, but also how it changes over time, called a diachronic study. To a certain extent, synchrony must come first, but in practice, both should feed into the other and research should move back and forth between both perspectives. In anthropology, diachronic studies have typically been the domain of archeologists and ethnohistorians, because those are the only kinds of studies that have access to data from a wide time frame. However, in recent years, many cultural anthropologists have been producing diachronic studies on smaller timescales, examining very specific examples of change, such as the consequences of a particular new law on minority populations. Before we begin looking at change in a more technical way, we need to think about what exactly we mean by that term. Remember that culture, capital C, is a set of ideas shared among people about how to get along in society. This includes ideas about relationships and interactions, of course, but also ideas about how the world works, how it's put together, the ways things should work, and even what kinds of technology are useful and how to construct them. So the processes of culture change apply to changes in material culture, the stuff, as well as cognitive culture, the ideas. Generally speaking, it's easier to see and track changes when they're happening to material culture because the scientists can actually see those things. But changes to ideas and behaviors are often much more significant in understanding people's lives. Anthropologists generally assume that if a cultural change survives and spreads, it must be adaptive in some way. That's one of the most basic traits of culture. But it's important to remember that individual people are not automatons. They may choose to adopt deliberately maladaptive traits. Ritual suicides are good examples of this fact. The Jonestown or the Heaven's Gate suicides occurred when the small, isolated subcultures deliberately chose to adopt a cultural behavior, that is suicide, that effectively ended the culture itself. So cultural changes are only adaptive if they and the culture itself persist. Regardless of whether changes are adaptive or not, most anthropologists agree that the changes themselves arise as a result of only a few processes. Basic to all processes is discovery or invention, where individuals presented with a problem find a solution to it. The problem of transporting heavy loads is solved with the invention of the wheel. The problem of getting along with one another in large groups is solved by the invention of government. Humans are remarkably good problem solvers, and when presented with a difficult problem, they'll usually find some way to solve it. Invention can be an intentional process undertaken by one or a few individuals to solve a particular immediate problem. Thomas Edison inventing the light bulb is a classic example.
On the other hand, some changes may be accidental. They're the unintended consequences of trying to accomplish some other goal. It's easy to find unintended cultural changes in modern history. The U.S. government tried to end the production and sale of alcohol with the 18th Amendment. The intended consequence of prohibition was a rise in the moral and ethical fabric of society, a reduction in vice and crime, and a general improvement of society. Instead, the unintended consequences were an explosion of organized crime and violence. The unintended consequences were so bad that Congress had to repeal prohibition. And of course, fossil fuels were intended to meet the energy requirements of our society, and their use has unintentionally degraded the environment. Let's change gears now and talk about how cultural changes spread. An innovation or new idea that arises in response to some need or as the unintended consequence of some other innovation still must be perpetuated and disseminated enough to become a shared aspect of culture. Idiosyncratic innovations aren't cultural because they're not shared, but if the idea proves useful enough, People within the culture will generally adopt it and keep it alive. If it isn't useful, like prohibition, it'll be discarded. Particularly useful ideas can spread outside the culture too, with neighboring cultures picking up the idea to solve their own problems. This process of spreading an idea from one culture to another is called diffusion. At one time, anthropologists, and especially archeologists, believed that diffusion explained most culture change around the world. The diffusionist school of thought thought that most cultural innovation arose at a single point in time and space and spread throughout the world from there. For example, V. Gordon Child, an archeologist working primarily in the 1930s and 40s, thought that cultural ideas like agriculture, writing, kingship, and urban life had all emerged first in the ancient Near East, and all other civilizations throughout the Old World were the result of those ideas diffusing outward from there. Chinese civilization, Indian civilization, European, were all indebted to Mesopotamia, and they would not have existed had Mesopotamia not existed first. Today, in addition to diffusion, we also recognize the role that independent invention plays in culture change. When presented with similar problems, there are only so many possible solutions, and it shouldn't be surprising that sometimes cultures come up with the same answers independently of one another. Agriculture actually developed independently in a half dozen places around the world because it's a good solution to the problem of feeding large populations. And writing developed independently because it's a highly effective solution to the need for record keeping. The trick is to be able to differentiate independent invention from diffusion, and that difference isn't always easy to recognize. But when it happens, diffusion follows one of a few patterns. The first and probably simplest is diffusion through direct contact. This is generally how ideas are spread within a society. Individuals who do not yet have that idea or practice see those who do, and they pick up the idea directly. This may happen during trading expeditions, common religious rites, or even during warfare. This image shows an obvious example of direct diffusion. It is extremely unlikely that a Mexican comic book artist would have independently invented Superman. Much more likely is that he saw an American comic and he liked the idea and then created his own version. Extending direct contact diffusion into a chain, you get intermediate contact or indirect diffusion, where the ideas and innovations originate in one culture, diffuse to another, then from that culture they diffuse to a third, and so on. This is how the concept of agriculture probably spread from the few places where it was independently invented. Each sequential village saw their neighbors farming food and decided to try it. Probably no one ever traveled from ancient Britain to Mesopotamia to bring back seeds, but nevertheless Mesopotamian wheat came to be farmed in Britain through this down-the-line transmission. Most cultural traits that cover a wide geographic area probably spread through indirect diffusion.
Finally, one form of diffusion that your textbook does not address is stimulus diffusion. This is a comparatively rare form of diffusion where the idea spreads, but not any actual items. Agriculture diffused through people actually watching farmers and seeing their crops, for example. Superman came to Mexico because someone moved across the border carrying an actual comic book. In stimulus diffusion, someone hears about some innovation and then, stimulated by that idea, invents his own version. The classic example of this is the Cherokee syllabary invented by Sequoia in the 19th century. Sequoia, like almost all of the Cherokee at the time, was illiterate. The Cherokee language had no writing system and he did not speak or write English. But he had heard stories about Euro-Americans drawing their words and he occasionally saw scraps of printed English. Even though those scraps were meaningless squiggles to him, Sequoia developed his own writing system based on the English alphabet. That system became the standard for writing Cherokee, and even today a Cherokee language newspaper is published in it. You can even download font files for use in your word processor. So in this case, what diffused was not writing itself, but the stimulus to develop writing. Had Sequoia been taught to read English, then adapted it for the Cherokee language, that would have been direct diffusion. Had he just decided Cherokee needed a record keeping system and thought one up, that would have been independent invention. But instead of either of those things happening, he was stimulated to invent the syllabary by his contact with English settlers. Diffusion is generally considered to take place between cultures interacting on a roughly equal basis. Each culture gives about as much as it gets out of the exchange. Those early farming communities each developed their own crops and traded them among themselves, for example. In forced diffusion, this balanced exchange isn't the case. In this form of change, a dominant culture forces its ideas and practices on a subordinate culture so that the subordinate culture becomes more and more like the dominant. This is what happened in many parts of the world under colonialism. European cultures forced their own ways of life on the natives while adopting much less of the native culture for themselves. Closely related to the idea of forced diffusion is acculturation. Some scholars use this term in the manner that Kotak does to describe cultures that become increasingly similar to one another due to ongoing contact. More often, you'll see the term applied to a more lopsided relationship in which members of one culture increasingly adopt the characteristics of another, losing many aspects of their own in the process. Acculturation often takes place in immigrant communities, subcultures whose members over time lose their subculture identity. Globalization has been understood as the acculturation of the whole world to Western culture. And today, of course, the most important issues of culture change to face the world have to do with globalization. Globalization is a whole suite of changes and processes starting a few hundred years ago and really accelerating in the last few decades that have broken down barriers between different cultures worldwide so that different societies are increasingly interconnected and interdependent. Globalization occurs through economic relationships, such as the spread of capitalism, technology, industrialization and the internet, for example, through political negotiations that create things like the United Nations, the European Union, and through other cultural traits like Hollywood movies, yoga, sushi, and so on. In the process, cultural traditions that used to be quite distinct from one another become more and more similar. In context terminology, Globalization is the spread of cultural generalities on a worldwide scale, and those generalities, by and large, originated as particularities of Western culture. If one topic dominates debate among professional anthropologists today, it's whether globalization is a good thing or a bad thing. It is undeniable that many non-Western individuals are eager to gain access to Western-style lifestyles. And it's also true that the average standard of living worldwide has increased dramatically during the era of globalization, at least by some measures.
but many anthropologists are quick to point out that globalization has hugely detrimental effects on many non-Western peoples, harming public health, destroying local ecosystems, and leading ultimately to the loss of much cultural diversity around the world. Kotak, wisely I think, draws a distinction between the idea of globalization as an observable fact and globalization as a policy. No one can reasonably deny that the world is more interconnected today than it was a few centuries ago. And since that is an observed fact, we as anthropologists must seek to explain how and why those changes have taken place. On the other hand, the idea that globalization is an inherently good thing is much more controversial. As a value judgment, it's beyond the scope of academic anthropology altogether. Science does not deal in good and bad, only true and false. But don't forget that cultural relativism and scientific objectivity don't mean that anthropologists can't also be moral actors. Applied anthropology by its nature requires a value judgment on the part of the anthropologist. How can we make the world better? Whether that agenda includes promoting or resisting globalization is dependent on the individual scholar and the specific circumstances. We'll look at globalization in much more detail toward the end of the semester. Finally, I'd like to talk about an issue that Kotak doesn't address, ethnogenesis. This is the emergence of new ethnic groups. It makes sense that if no culture is ever static and unchanging, that over a long enough period of time, change can accumulate within a cultural tradition until the ancestors and the descendants no longer share the same cultural identity. The process by which a new cultural tradition emerges from an older tradition is called ethnogenesis. We'll discuss ethnicity in more detail in a couple weeks, but for now we can equate ethnic group with a lowercase c culture. The best examples of ethnogenesis are found in colonial contexts around the world. As outside colonial powers move in and forced culture change on native populations, that is through forced diffusion, the native ethnic identities changed in response. The process happened repeatedly in North America following European colonization. The example I'm going to give comes from the US Southeast, an area where much of my own research has been focused. So the first European explorers in the U.S. Southeast arrived in 1539, led by Spanish conquistador Hernando de Soto. At that time, the native cultures were organized into a variety of large chiefdoms, each with distinct political and ethnic identities, though much was also shared in common. Archaeologists call all these cultures Mississippian, though they considered themselves very diverse. They refer to themselves by names like Okute, Cofitacheki, Kusa, Hoara, names that today are largely meaningless to anyone who isn't an archaeologist or historian. These chiefdoms were politically complex, with sophisticated government structures, a ranked nobility, and large territories. After De Soto's expedition passed through the region, it was largely ignored by Europeans for more than a half century. Sometime after De Soto's expedition, however, smallpox and measles spread through the natives, causing a massive population crash and ending the Mississippian lifestyle. When such a large portion of the population dies, it simply becomes impossible to perpetuate the same large-scale, complex cultural traditions that De Soto found. By the middle of the 17th century, the surviving natives had reorganized into large autonomous towns. Gone were the big, complex territorial chiefdoms of the 16th century. Now each town was independent of the others, governed by its own chief and his council. Each town also had its own ethnic identity. There were the Kwasati, the Alibama, the Hichiti, the Muskogi, and many others. Most of these names are also meaningless to anyone not a historian, but a couple are oddly familiar, like the Alibama. In the late 1600s, British colonists began to enter the area from the east and French colonials from the west. In response to these outside pressures, the native towns allied with one another in a confederation, 
as time passed and the different towns spent more and more time acting together, the boundaries that had made them distinct ethnic groups began to break down. Cultural ideas diffused from all the towns to all the others, and the communities began to acculturate to one another. By the late 18th century, individual towns had largely ceased to consider themselves separate ethnic groups and had begun seeing themselves as all part of a larger Creek Confederacy. This name should be familiar to most Americans from their history classes in school. As time passed, external pressures created by American colonists sparked more and more internal debates within the Creek Confederacy. As the different factions within the Confederacy contested their own cultural traditions, the stresses became intolerable. Early in the 19th century, a civil war broke out in the Confederacy called the Red Stick War. When the Red Stick faction lost the war, they split off from the rest and moved southward into Florida. A generation later, these former Creeks called themselves the Seminole Nation. What this highlights is the fluid nature of ethnic identity and how culture changes and adapts as conditions in the environment change. The Mississippian cultural tradition changed into various post-Mississippian towns, and when circumstances changed again, those people's diverse identities fused into the single Creek identity. Further change split that group into the Creeks and the Seminoles. It would be a mistake to think of the Seminoles and the Creeks as completely different, just as it would be wrong to think of them as exactly the same. Change is a constant dimension of culture, and diachronic studies are absolutely essential to understanding culture. In our next lecture, we'll shift our attention away from the culture concept to talk about anthropological method and theory in more detail. How do we apply this concept to make sense of the human experience?